styles and genres, changing every season with an original story and brand new characters to meet, all woven together on the spot. It's the comedy of an improv podcast, but with a cohesive, complete story. Yeah, you can't definitely what? not attack it. That. Why? Beat it up. Why? It's because it's bird. A, you gotta hurt You gotta this hurt animal. it and so that you can capture it and he's yours. Is that what the plan is? You Enslave gotta catch them all. that oh animal. My God. It's the adventure of an actual play podcast, but you feel like you're right there with us. We don't have time. We have to get to the Green Chapel now. You idiots are traveling too slowly for adventuring. I have a five foot two man on my back at all times. Steph, get off of her back and do your own walking. One of your steps is like four of mine. Then you better get it up, haven't you? All right, fine. <clears throat> You have to tell me if something's coming. I can't see over tree lines. Can somebody get him some stilts? <laughs> Make me some, wizard. I can't hear you down there. It's the polish of an audio drama, but not even we know what's going to happen next. Roll for power, Masha. <laughs> what is it? Polcarella. Yes! <gasps> An epic audio quest to tell the best story possible in every genre imaginable. Embark now on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your app of choice. I've always believed that all those romantic stories where you just made that special someone and the world just changes are just another capitalist scam. But... Our story is not one meant for Facebook walls or Twitter threads or big budget Yankee Hollywood movies. This way, when I find you, do you have records of all the times I thought of you? Isn't that romantic? <laughs> ah, Seal. I can't wait to kill you. You're a god. If I pray to you, would you like it? Is that what I need to do to see you again? It wouldn't be the first time that I'm on my knees for the interest. Shit. I look back at the rest of the objects and I can hear the voices inside me, inside my chest, my head, my stomach. Read me, touch me, lean in. When I stare at the cup, there is just silence. When I wrap my hands around it, I expect the wax to warm me, but it is lukewarm, it's pleasant. I lift it, and I drink it, drink, drink, drink. Dose After You. Find it wherever you listen to podcasts. Lamplight Radio Play is an anthology podcast adopting the short horror fiction of Lamplight Magazine. Our stories are spooky, unsettling, and a slow burn. And to show you what we're about, we present this two-minute short, A Talk with the Falling Girl. Okay, this is an EVP. It's June 21st, 12.55 a.m. We're at the former site of the Oakdale Mansion. This is an attempt at using Jamie's EMF booster. We're going to try to summon the apparition of what locals call the Falling Girl. You guys ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Here we go. We're running. Battery's at 95%. <gasps> you guys see that, right? Call the fire department. Did you call the fire department? Hello, there are people still in there. Call the fire department. Is she talking to us? Is that a cell phone? It's not a phone. We need to get to a phone. Hey, hey, it's okay. Jamie, turn it off. The fire's over. It's all done. Everyone inside, where is everybody? Don't worry. It's over. You can calm down. Dude, turn it off! We're down to 40% already. What about Jake? Jake Haddon. He's really tall and he's skinny. He's got black hair tied in a ponytail. 
Look, I know it was scary, but everything's okay now. No. Jake was with me in the attic. The only way he could have gotten out is if, if he had jumped and you would have seen him. It's okay. It's all over now. 15%. It's a yes or no question. Was anyone else stuck in that house? Everybody's okay. Everybody made it out. You are a fucking liar. Hey, are you okay? Yeah. She touched you, right? She touched you? She did. Oh. <laughs> Holy crap! Oh, Jesus Christ. Did we get, we got that. Oh my God, yeah, yeah, we got it. I don't know at what expense, but yeah, yeah, we got it. Oh, God. <sighs> oh God, that poor girl. How long till we try again? <sighs> never, Come never, on. ever, ever. Come on. Lamplight radio play. Quiet horror. Unsettle your ears. Sure I can't get you a drink? Uh, I, um... They'd had a moment, hadn't they? That afternoon when Garrett had smiled just like this, warm-eyed and amused in a way that made Tony want another cigarette, but also want to step forward and... Hey, Kate, what are you writing? Ah! New text post on Thursday, May 21st. Title. Why you should be watching Selkirk. So, Selkirk fandom, who wants to read my 5,000 word essay, Garrett, last name, Secret Werewolf? I'm Kate, by the way. They kiss? I think I lucked out when I found Selkirk. Because if I'd loved something else, I would have made friends, and I would have been able to read a ton of great stories. But this way, I met you. Me and Day You, a new story about love and fandom from the Procyon Podcast Network. Hi, this is Alexander, one of the members of the team bringing you the PodTales programming you just listened to. PodTales is committed to free, accessible programming to explore and celebrate the art of creative fiction podcasting. This means our live panels are captioned and ASL interpreted, the episodes in our podcast feed have accessible transcripts, and all our programming is free. But in order to make all of that happen, we need support from fans, creators, and listeners like you. If you can, the best way to help PodTales grow is through a monthly contribution over on our Patreon page. Any amount that you can offer gets you year-round access to our Discord server, early access to episodes, updates from PodTales headquarters, and more. Check out the goals on the page for some cool plans we have coming soon. Head on over to patreon.com slash podtales to make your contribution today. Help us keep PodTales free and accessible, and help us celebrate the incredible world of fiction podcasting. Again, that's patreon.com slash podtales. Thank you. I saw a war coming. It's the Dead Eyes. Dead Eyes will never beat visionaries. That's how evolution works. It doesn't matter why I did it. You are standing here because of it. Me! This is my assignment. You work under me. Rebel against the Arch Seer. Stop saying what you can't and start doing what you can. I'm not running. If they rebel, we will win. Ash to flame! Flame to ash! Visionaries, an audio drama, wherever you listen to podcasts. I think. Yeah. It'll be great. Oh, most definitely. I mean. What is this? Once a year, we come together for celebration. We come together for discussion. We come together for her. What, el- what else do we come together for? Fun? Eh. Yeah. It's quite a celebration, isn't it? Transfiguration? No. Um. <sighs> revision. Eh. Refinement. Eh. A revolution. Uh, um, development? Exploration? Yes! Exploration, exploration, thank you. We come together for exploration. After all, we exist whether we like it or not, and we do not exist alone whether we like it or not. As big as the world is, it's still very small. 
yes, the sea even more so, so vast and deep that to ponder its depths for too long is known to cause feelings of existential dread. What lies beneath? As vast as the ocean is, how vast and varied are those who call it home. Celebration, discussion, expiration, that's why we're here. The mermaid, beautiful and terrifying. That's why we're here. But to celebrate the mermaid, must we isolate them in the process? No, and I don't think anyone is asking you to. Yeah, but mermaids are why we're here. Yes, and they are here. Plus, I mean, it makes sense. They have lives. They do have lives. And in those lives, they exist. And they do not exist alone. So, yeah. It'll be great. Oh, most definitely. That was... Dallas Wheatley as the reassuring friend. And Sade Oyama Kinwa as the worrier. Sound design by Chroma. Come on in, the water's fine. Season 2, Mermaids and Other Monsters. Four different episodes, four different conversations. Join us Wednesdays in May. Listen on Spotify, Radio Public, Podchaser, and many other wonderful podcatchers. We'll see you soon. Enter the Dreamnasium, a world of science and fiction without limits, where humanity has spread among the stars. Mama used to say the universe was a wheel, with Terra Primus at the center and alternate Terras spread along the spokes. Do you know, in my youth, I dreamed of this place, a place of stars above and below, a place of darkness and beauty. I have left your atmosphere. Proceeding to rendezvous point. You going to be able to handle this? On your own, I mean. Where mystery and intrigue meet. I've never had anyone look at me that way before. Like you recognize me. And I sort of feel the same, but we've never met. Hold on. We're tracking something. Target inbound at point five eight luminal. Think it's your friends? They're not my friends. They're not anyone's friends. This is Terra Nova 3, Bug. I wait too long, I stay open too long, I'm dead. Filled with denizens who delight and despair. You have got to be kidding me with these heels. And this body? Have you seen this? It's a little hard to miss, kid. Okay, so what do we know? He likes red? To wear, I mean, just red, neck to heel. We see you. Your life, your solitude, must be crushing, even for one such as you. Where just surviving can be a struggle. Faster than anyone I've ever seen. That's no, no. How how can that be? I just know I'm in danger. I've been followed, you see. Men in dark suits with dark cars. They're hurting me. Well, they're in for a shock. I don't get scared, I get cold inside. And then someone gets hurt. Pendant Productions proudly presents a new sci-fi anthology show, Jeffrey Thorne's Dreamnasium, on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and more. Or download directly via PendantAudio.com. This is so exciting. Aren't you excited? It is a very promising development. led me down to I don't know where as we left the pitch black of the stairs we met a long corridor wide enough for wheeling parts to the elevator at the back the sound changed the street outside was muted we lost the creaking of the ceiling instead we could hear movement scratching of tiny nails scampering to hide away from a foreign noise we broke
brought in breath and step and conversation in a place which had been silent for an age. Every room was dormant, the walls were concrete corner to corner, indents were left on the ground where once was something heavy, now empty. Except one. After getting our bearings, we found an old office with a cracked leather couch. This was our spot. So we stopped, sat down, Luke pulled out two bottles, and we toasted to our closed down ghost town. <laughs> Podtails is committed to free, accessible programming to explore and celebrate the art of creative audio fiction. That means our live panels are captioned and ASL interpreted. The episodes in our podcast feed have accessible transcripts, and all our programming is free. 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 But in order to make all that happen, we need support from fans, from creators, from listeners like you. If you can, the best way to help Podtails grow is through a monthly contribution over on our Patreon page. Any amount that you can offer gives you year-round access to our Discord server, early access to episodes, and more. We have some really exciting things planned. Head on over to patreon.com slash podtails to make your contribution today. Help us keep podtails free and accessible, and help us celebrate the incredible world of audio fiction. Again, that's patreon.com slash podtails. Thanks. What is that? That appears to be a twister. One hundred years after Dorothy's adventures, two cousins are swept from Kansas to a mysterious land. Allow me to welcome you to the land of Oz. Oz? Full of strange and wondrous people. Call me Felina. I'm tired of living on the streets. I will not tolerate any rule breaking from you. But they can't forget what they left behind. My mom is the only person I have in the whole world right now. Right before I ended up here, she and I got into a big fight. I can't let that be the last time I spoke to her. And their new companions have troubles of their own. Am I to stay up here and rot in a city full of Tinker Toys that will break and have no one here to fix them? This is the fourth school I've been to in a year. I keep having to switch so no one catches on that I'm a witch. Jessica, you are not the only one with family to get back to. Many trials lay in their path. Beware the wheelers? What's a wheeler? (laughs) <laughs> what makes it forbidden? I don't want to find out! Go left! And the way ahead is not always clear. Don't you hammerheads get it yet? The wizard is gone. Glinda is gone. There's nobody left in Oz who can help you, and probably no one who wants to. But hope is not lost. There's no time to lose. It's very important that you get to Emerald City and ask for Ozma's help. How do we start for Emerald City? Why, the same way people have done it for hundreds of years. Hit the Bricks! Hit the Bricks is a radio play set in the land of Oz. Subscribe at a podcatcher near you and follow us on twitter.com at hitthebrickspod. Transcripts are available at hitthebricks.com. Really nothing to it. All you gotta do is hit the bricks. I know that you can't do it. Hit the Bricks. Who will you find on the Chimera? Hey, uh... Light-eating space monster? A seven-foot-tall heretical catman. The human hacker, gadgeteer, and technophile. A galactic lawyer from the wrong side of the Akashic bleed. A living financial instrument. Sort of like a, a rhino centaur, almost. Hamster people? Right? Chinchilla people. Chinchilla, Chinchilla people. people, excuse me. The bog witch of Zed? The honorable Lord Mayor. A bright red mustachioed land manatee. Technical or werewolf guys? Janelle Monet. Yeah, she's Janelle Monet. exactly. This is the halfling Janelle Monet. The Chimera. Unexpected characters in unlikely situations. This is Just Press Playhouse. Wind the watch now, son. We'll help you defeat him. You can't keep me away from him. I am Animal Caracas. I am more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Stay away from our son, you bastard. No! Impossible! Where is his power coming from? It's not supposed to be this way! The sunstone is mine! This is the power of love! 
You're out of time, Caracas. You can't get rid of me forever. I'll find a way back to your dimension. I'll be back for you. Me and my watch will be here waiting. Ah! The light! It's tearing me apart! Go home and let me sleep. I'll talk to you, Mayana. But Carmelita, she's so sad. Abuelo said they canceled Christmas this year. What? Christmas is canceled? Who says? Abuelo! You don't think Santa wouldn't do that, would he? All I know is Santa needs light to show him the way to all the boys and girls on Christmas Day. And if there ain't no luces, not even a spark, then Christmas in Borinquen will be sad and dark. I'm sorry, I was curious. Here, take the doubloon back. It's too late. Because you took the kiss and the coin, you are now cursed for the rest of your days. You will never experience love again. And wherever you go, people will revile you, spit at you. They'll want to hurt you, and you shall have to do unspeakable things to survive. The only way to remove the curse is to throw your coin into this well. Good luck finding it again. And just like that, she was gone. Yo! I was listening by the doorway the whole time, girl. That was badass. You told him where to stick it. I think I'm gonna throw up. That's just the adrenaline. I feel the same way every time I'm on stage. I've been on stage plenty, remember? And you will again, which is why I made you these. Um, what is it? Ballet shoe balloons. To remind you to keep dancing. Keep chasing your dreams. Thanks, Finn. You chase your dreams down, too. Where are they, Pop? Where does he keep them? <gasps> there will be great tribulation unmatched from the beginning of the world until now and never to be seen again. Pop? Pop! Where does he keep them, huh? Tell me, where are they? <laughs> Door. In the back. <laughs> There's a cellar. See? That wasn't hard. Could have avoided this whole mess. Verily I say unto you, lest these days be cut short, none of us will be saved. Yeah, we'll just have to figure out a way around that too. I notice that your first destination is Arabella, but that's not on your way. It's the first destination the writer went to. It's sacred. <laughs> Oh, how excited are you? On a scale of 1 to 10. A billion. I thought the waters at Coast Venus were clear. This is... That's something else. Visitors. Of course. You're Captain Valeria, right? Of the Ultramarine? Yep. That's me. And that's her, the Ultramarine. Sentimentality is a virtue of ours. It is ingrained in our people. I'm sure such a thoughtful gift will cheer her right up. One of the most important people we have to meet is in Arabella. Who was this person? Uh, no one knows, actually. Signed Venus, Part 1. Listen on May 27. Do you two know anything? Hi there, this is Jordan Stillman, one of the members of the team bringing you the Podtails programming you just listened to. Podtails is committed to free, accessible programming to explore and celebrate the art of creative audio fiction. That means our live panels are captioned and ASL interpreted, the episodes in our podcast feed have accessible transcripts, and all our programming is free. But in order to make all of that happen, we need support from fans, creators, and listeners like you. If you can, the best way to help Podtails grow is through a monthly contribution over on our Patreon page. Any amount that you can offer gets you year-round access to our Discord server.
Welcome to Podtails 2020. I'm Bob Rimunda, one of the organizers of Podtails. We're so excited to be putting on programming devoted exclusively to imagine, imaginative audio storytelling throughout the month of November. Today, play. Thank you so much for joining us. At the top of this program, we would like to offer a land acknowledgement, a statement that pays respects to the indigenous people who live here and who had their land stolen from them by colonizers. It is only the very first barest step in what we can do to support indigenous people today. The following acknowledgement of what to keep in mind as we participate in this digital space is written by Adrian Wong of Spiderweb. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technology, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints contributing to cli changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. I invite you to join us in acknowledging all of this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each other, for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. Next, I would like to thank our sponsors, Sarah Lawrence College and the Sarahs, Fool and Scholar Productions, Fable and Folly, Sleep With Me, Dagaz Media, and Winter Hill Brewing Company. These are major contributors who helped us sustain Podtails 2020 and allowed our show to continue virtually this year. Learn more on our website sponsor page. Podtails 2020 is completely free. We believe in making the resources we're creating available and accessible to all. If you like what we're doing here and you have the means, please consider sp supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash podtails. ASL interpretation for this session will be provided by Brandon C. Kazen Maddox of Body Language Productions. Learn more about Brandon's work at brandonkazen-maddox.com. Please feel free to use the chat feature here on YouTube to say hello and ask a question of our panelists today. I'll be keeping an eye on the conversation. We'll pose a few of these to our group before the end of the hour. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Chad Ellis, who will be leading our session for the day. Chad Ellis is a Los Angeles-based writer, voice actor, and sound designer. He is best known for creating the Antarctic Isolation Horror Podcast, Station Blue, as well as his sound and editing work on Hit the Bricks, Arden, Dungeons and Daddies, Story Break, and 20-Sided Stories. Take it away, Chad. Hi, thank you, Bob, and thank you, Brandon. Um, that was a good introduction for what I have going on. Um, some things I work on that might be relevant to this panel that we're about to get into is I've been playing role-playing games for 20 years now, uh, including all of the games played by these panelists here. Um, I also do, I edit the Dungeons and Daddies bonus content, so one shots, their talk show, that sort of thing. Uh, and I was on the cast of the most recent season of uh, 20 Sided Stories, Marvel, Survivor of the Snap. Uh, so I am uh, around actual plays. I don't actually run actual plays. Uh, to, with us today are what I consider some experts in various corners uh, of this new landscape that we find ourselves in. Uh, the panel itself. So uh, something I want to focus on here is how can, a how can your choice of game systems reflect the values that inform your gameplay? Our panelists will discuss working within the structures of popular systems, as well as the narrative opportunities offered by innovative indie systems by creators from marginalized backgrounds. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our pan panelists. Um, first, we have Mariam Ahmad from the Musafers podcast, uh, which is a decolonized actual play podcast using the fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons system. It's currently eight episodes into its first campaign. Uh, on top of being involved in a number of tabletop role-playing projects such as Prism Pals, uh, which is an LGBTQ plus podcast that tells diverse and inclusive stories, they are also working on Sarzamine, which is an original ta tabletop role-playing fantasy setting uh, that sets its design around South Asians and Desi peoples at its center without the voyeuristic Eurocentric POV lens. 
Uh, you can find more information at their Patreon page, which we will link later on. They use they, them pronouns. Next, we have Luke Strom, who is the... Oh, yes. Okay. We're back in. Uh, was anything we just talked about heard by the audience or should I start over? Okay, uh, I am Chad Ellis. Uh, if you heard Bob's uh, bit before, I do sound design and I create a number of audio dramas. Uh, I also do work on Dungeons and Daddies, which is an actual play podcast. I do their one shots and bonus material. And I was on the recent season Marvel Survivor of the Snap of 20 Sided Stories, which was created by Sage GC, who's here with us today. Um, a few notes on this panel going forward. The panel will go on for an hour. We're going to discuss with the panelists for about 45 minutes and then take questions from the audience. I'm going off of the assumption that you, the audience, are interested in making an actual play podcast. So we're not trying to sell you on actual plays. We're trying to give you wisdom and information on making your own actual plays. Uh, so without further ado, I want to introduce our panelists. Uh, very exciting guests here. We have, uh, for starters, Miriam Amat, who is the creator of and game master of the Musa First podcast, which is a decolonized actual play podcast using the fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons system. It's currently eight episodes into its first campaign. Uh, on top of being involved with a number of tabletop role-playing projects, such as Prism Pals, which is an inclusive LGBTQ plus podcast that tells diverse stories, uh, they are also working on an original role-playing setting called Zarzamine. Zarzam that is set that sets uh, Desi and South Asian peoples at its center, as opposed to the typical voyeuristic Eurocentric point of view that we often find in our settings. But you can find more information at their Patreon page, which we will link later on. We also have Luke Strom, who uses who is the keeper of the Call of Cthulhu Mystery Program, which is a cinematic tabletop audio drama wrought with unknowable horror and black comedy using the Call of Cthulhu role-playing systems. He spent more than a decade running live actual play games at Megacon in Orlando and has currently run two full campaigns for the Call of Cthulhu Mystery Program, with more on the way. He will be running a two-night Call of Cthulhu game on the 13th and the 14th of this month, which is next week, uh, that benefits the Trans Law Center. And finally, we have Sage GC, who is the director, designer, and composer of 20-Sided Stories, which is an improvised anthology actual play podcast with campaigns in the Pokemon and the Marvel Universe. Uh, with its current season, The Twilight Space, features five different highly produced one-shots. So far, they've done A24's The Green Knight, as well as Stephanie Meyer's The Twilight Saga, with three more which are yet to be revealed. Um, on top of designing original podcast-friendly role-playing game systems to suit each campaign, uh, he edits for the hit comedy podcast Hello for the Magic Tavern. So, with all those introductions aside, I'd like to jump into the first question. Why did you pick the system you picked for your podcast? Why did you pick your role-playing systems? What went in into that decision? Uh, Miriam, if you would start. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so I had D&D &D was one of the first systems I played with. And um, it's what 
I started actually writing Sarzamine in. Uh, so that was a bit of a logical conclusion. However, uh, when we finish this first campaign, uh, we will be moving towards uh, to another system as we are trying to move away from D&D due to a lot of the WotC drama that has happened that I don't want to get into right this minute. Mm -hmm. uh, what system are you looking at next uh, to replace uh, that? Yeah, so we're looking at a couple of systems. Um, I've been playing with Quest for a while. Um, it's a newer um, system in the market, and it's very much like if you've played D and D, it's a good kind of stepping stone, mm -hmm. um, and it's a lot more rules light. Uh, but that's not going to be the system where uh, we'll be using for the Musafers. We're actually still working over what that will be based on the new casting and everything that's going on. So, um, but we're looking at a lot more indie systems that fit the story better. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for being patient with us. Um, I know you were getting some audio before, not video. We're not going to go back over the entire introduction again. I'm going to just pass it back over to Chad, and we'll let Chad start from there. Thank you again for your patience. Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to start with the first question uh, for Muriam, which is, why did you pick the system you picked for your role-playing games? What went into the decision? Uh, yeah, so um, as I had said uh, previously, that D&D uh, &D was the first system that I started playing role play games in. It was um, where I started uh, writing the initial things for Serves Amin, uh, which is the campaign setting. And it seemed like the logical first step. However, with time and learning more about uh, game design and everything, we're actually going to be moving away from um, Dungeons and Dragons and moving to another system that we're still actually working out. So in a way, <laughs> it's great for this panel. Um, I've played with Quest as well, uh, which is a nice rules light game that is a stepping stone away from D&D, if that's where you want to go. Uh, but there's a lot of indie games that um, have a variety of me mechanics that can be more tailored to what you want. So it's, there's a lot out there. Yeah, definitely. Luke, how about for the Call of Cthulhu mystery program? Yeah, sure thing. Um, well, I mean, similarly, in, in, in the case of mine, it wasn't really a, uh, uh, I, I guess, a decision so much because in in this context it started out of a like a pledge drive where it was to run call of cthulhu based on the requests of listeners and so i was actually just brought in as kind of a ringer for that as someone who has experience with uh running call of cthulhu as a tabletop game and as a larp and so um i got brought in for that uh but even so um uh, you know, going into like the second series of it, you know, we didn't have to necessarily stick with the same system, but all in all, I think it's, it's one that um, I'm pretty comfortable with and familiar with. And, and I think it has um, a certain simplicity to it that I think suits things very well to give, uh, uh, especially new players, uh, a sense of, um, uh, what their character is about, and um, uh, but also gives them a lot of narrative freedom within what their character is outside of what they can do, um, uh, and it's it's got a simplicity to it because it's all based on percentages, which are I think relatively uh, um, understandable to most people right off the bat. Like we've had several people who have never played an RPG before pick up. Um, uh, Call of Cthulhu, and after maybe 15 minutes of explaining it, they understand the basics. And I think that's one of the strengths of the system. 
Um, I mean, there's other games out there, like, you know, even in that context of mythos investigation, you know, there's stuff like Cthulhu Dark or um, Trail of Cthulhu that are uh, a little rules lighter, I guess, perhaps. But um, I think uh, in a way, just that angle of percentages, I think it's, it's, a, it's a simple, comprehensible thing. And it's the core of the game system. And it's just, it's easy for people to understand and pick up without a lot of secondary rules knowledge. Like once they get that core little bit, they're usually good to go. Excellent, thank you. And then Sage, you don't so much pick your rule systems as you make rule systems. Uh, what do you take in consideration, for example, with the differences of Pokemon versus Marvel when you're creating a role-playing system specifically for an actual play podcast? Sure. Um, yeah, when we started the show three years ago, we made a very deliberate decision to not do Dungeons and Dragons. Um, the biggest reason being that's what literally everybody is doing and like the overwhelming majority of actual play podcasts are using D and D five E. So I just didn't really have any interest in, you know, doing something that everybody else was doing. And through that, me and some of the, the founders of the show were experimenting with game design. And uh, at the time I was still uh, pretty new to, to the, the medium, both in podcasting and in tabletop games. Um, but I was, I was somewhat familiar with video game design. So I took a lot of my knowledge with game design in video games and kind of put that into, uh, what we do. And, uh, also with improv, we're a bunch of improvisers and, uh, first, and, uh, I think tabletop gamers second. So every system I've designed is really more of an improv game, I would say rather than a uh a a fully fledged like you know rule book or whatever the first thing i designed was the one system and that i already feel like was a little more complicated than everything else that has come since it seems that the more rules that i add to a system the more the improv kind of uh gets stifled a little bit and people end up in their heads um, thinking about it. And I'm, I'm just trying with every system I design to prioritize this like natural back and forth energy between the players and the dice are just kind of there as this, this element of surprise, this like smoking gun that that'll go off. So something I'm noticing that's in common with everybody here is simplicity is good. Um, whether that's inherent in the system you're already using. Uh, and I have some visual aids because I realize some people probably haven't played all of the games we're talking about. So we're going to be talking about the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons quite a bit, just because that feels like the common language, you know, in the same way where you had like talking boards and seances in like the Victorian age that became fashionable. Now we have fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. Um, which, you know, this is one of the rule books for it. And if you see all of those rules, that's, and this is a very simplified edition previ to previous things. And even um, Call of Cthulhu, which I already also have a rule book for here, can get pretty thick. Um, and so I'm interested in how do we adapt these uh, for the audience, especially if we can't assume that the audience knows what our role-playing systems are. Um, something you all engage with uh, in my opinion, is some kind of subversion of the base assumptions of either the game systems or the culture around your games. So, for example, uh, Call of Cthulhu, for one, is this Lovecraftian system. And we all have, you know, I think our culture as a whole has kind of come to this place with Lovecraft of realizing, like, we should move forward from this. And your cast members, especially for the upcoming stream, are very diverse. It's a very queer audience, which you wouldn't normally see in a Cthulhu universe. And also where I know that there are member, you know, mental illness is something many members are familiar with. Uh, and yet you have this sanity system. So like in the way where you're subverting the assumptions that you would have when you're picking up like a Lovecraft novel. Or uh, with Musafers, you're doing this decolonized podcast that has nothing to do with the European roots that are so often assumed. And often when like Wizards of the Coast tries to venture out into non-Eurocentric, it's a simplified thing. Like with the, uh, oh, what was that rule set they did, which was the hex crawl. Like 
you're just like, oh, you have, here's a tribe and here is a, you know, it's just, okay, we're just going to do this monolithic culture. And then with Sage in the most recent 20 sided stories full campaign you did with, of Marvels, we have this typical like hyper militarized, like neoliberal great man theory. Uh, and yet you have made like almost this, I know you're not a communist, but almost this communist campaign <laughs> where you have this like mutual aid group gathering to help people who actually need help on the streets who are often harmed by these superheroes. Um, I, and I think that's something a lot of people, as Sage mentioned, like fifth edition D and D has become kind of ubiquitous and now we're branching away from it. What are some things that you have found drives those subversions and what are recommendations you have for the audience on how you might be able to take a system that pushes you in one way and push against it? Uh, and let's, let's go backwards. So Sage, if you want to start off. So can you uh, re say the question one more time? Right. So what, how does the, you're, how, how are you subverting kind of the assumption of, for example, the Marvel setting? And how does that, how, how are the role playing systems and the setting you're picking changing the values that would normally be assumed with that system? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think this actually starts with our Pokemon season. And then it's just something I've kind of like latched on to since, which was, um, with each like little mini system I've designed, um, you know, I'm trying to incorporate elements from whatever it is the IP that we're making a parody of to, you know, make sure that, that it's unique to that world and not just some sort of catch all that we can just, you know, copy paste over and over again that feels a little lazy. Um, and with Pokemon, I personally have just always had a vendetta with the fact that it's a it's a single player game and how much the entire franchise is built off of just disgusting uh, capitalist like uh, the fact that they were every game release they release it twice <laughs> uh, side by side and it's an identical game but you gotta buy it twice if you want to actually complete it uh, I've always hated that and so my my vision with the system for that was to make it about teamwork um, and not about you know um, catching them all so to speak and then and and that i think that really worked out and that was a really big theme in the story that spoke to people and so marvel was just the same thing for me you have um literally the highest grossing movies of all time <laughs> with the avengers and they're great films like i have a great time but um you find th there's something kind of sick about how much money and how many resources they have to make those films that have edged out all like lower tiers of competition and uh and and indie filmmaking and so i just incorporated more of that into the marvel system as well it's like why would i want to tell big bolstery superhero stories when i can focus on the little guy so to speak and mm -hmm. um made the system about yeah like a smaller community trying to um uh hold their own against a world that very much has this one percent versus 99 percent built into it excellent thank you and then luke uh to kind of tailor this towards you um having the awareness that your crew does of things like say mental illness and also the legacy of lovecraft what are ways that you found the call of cthulhu system pushes you towards that legacy and what are ways you found to either break free from it um, or, or discussions you've had with your own crew on things like the sanity system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean with it, I, th there's kind of a couple facets, I guess, in my context, because, you know, there's, there's the system side of things and then there's also the you know, kind of cultural aspect of things too, you know, like, I guess to touch on the cultural side of things, you know, that's very much, you know, like, uh, uh you know, waspy purity horror. Uh, uh, is kind of a core to uh, um, Lovecraft's experience. But if you genericize that a little bit and, and kind of remove it from that immediate context of um, just this larger sense of something is wrong in the world and um, uh, that there are forces at work that can crush us like a bug. And it's not even evil because people don't even think about it or know any better when you when you pull back to that higher level of it 
um, you know, that I think resonates with a lot of people and, and, and especially nowadays, <laughs> like, you know, what would something say like institutional racism? You know, that's, that's, that's a thing where in a lot of cases, no person is necessarily pushing a deliberate agenda. They're just part of a giant mindless system that, that has all of these effects and that do have these very real, uh, terrible consequences for small people. And in a way, I think there's an analog to, you know, great old ones in that context. Like, you know, Cthulhu is not out to harm people. Cthulhu is not even awake. Cthulhu is sleeping under the ocean and just by existing has these effects. Um, so I think in that context, that's something where I think uh, that cosmic horror really resonates across the board, uh, specifically to the cultural side of things, like, you know, with like kind of the queer angle, queer people always existed. It's just, you know, we, we have a tendency to treat, uh, we as a, I mean, as like, you know, monolithic culture kind of in, the, in that sense, treat a lot of the stuff from back then. Like if you, if you see, you know, pictures of, of a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, women, like a couple of women in slip in slips, uh, uh, playing around at a, uh, in a picnic, you know, Oh, it's just gals being pals. They're definitely not lesbians. You know, that like, there's so much of that. Like if you look back to like old pictures of world war two and like nurses together and it's like, I don't, I don't think they're just pals. <laughs> um, so just having characters that are in that context, I think uh, just helps make that more of a real thing. And then of course, you've also got the racial aspect, which, you know, in that, in that time, uh, um, you know, the twenties was really the, that a lot of people nowadays don't necessarily realize that, but that was the resurgent era of the Ku Klux Klan. Like they were, they were back and at their most organized and powerful at that period in time, like um, with it, you know, having regular marches in DC and things like that, like in, in the early twenties around that. And they had entirely changed their focus to uh, fear of, of immigrants and Catholics. And uh, 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 in addition to, you know, the, 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 the more preexisting, you know, hating of, you know, liberals and, and uh, uh, and African Americans and 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 things like that. Um, there's just that stew of that. And with uh, nowadays, I think there's a, a good overall cultural reexamination of that period, where uh, you know we're a tiny little part of that. But you've also got things like uh, you know the Ballad of Black Tom, which is a book that is basically reexamining uh, the horror Red Hook, which is one of Lovecraft's most racist stories, uh, mm -hmm. where he's just absolutely terrible about immigrants. And, and um, you know, you've got, obviously, there's elements of that in Lovecraft country. You've got... Um, uh, well, I've, not you I've know. noticed you guys had an interview with the Harlem Unbound. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Group, in which, for those who haven't known, um, it uses the Call of Cthulhu kind of setting, but coming from the context of Harlem. Yeah, and So yeah. rather than having this very white-centric, you have this black-centric... A view of that, which I think makes the setting more effective from times I've oh, seen definitely. people play it. Yeah, it's yeah, because when we're dealing with the Harlem Renaissance and it's all this wonderful things that a lot of people don't even necessarily know all that much about. So it's a good chance to learn about that. But it's also a, a good chance to really experience kind of that that facet of it in a, in a more real way where, you know, like one of the stories out of there is, you know, Harlem Hellfighters Never Die, which is about the Harlem Hellfighters who, you know, basically went to World War One, fought with the French, got treated like people, came back to America and almost didn't even get a parade. They weren't allowed to march with the white soldiers. And uh, and then, you know, so um, elements of all of that um, are, are definitely coming into uh, Call of Cthulhu as a game specifically because I think it's well positioned to address that. So you've got things like, like that. There's a, another one that's the Sassoon Files that takes place in... Um, Shanghai uh, in the in the 20s and 30s, which is, you know, a very uh, um, rollicking and, and, and interesting place where you had a lot of, you know, um, you had, you know, Chinese indigenous uh, um, uh, communist movements, you had uh, um, uh, various colonial powers that were still there, you had, you know, the Japanese um, uh, as well as as um, 
kind of an overarching dangerous hegemon. Uh, um, and it's a lot of uh, just interesting, entirely different cultural contexts. Right. Um, so I think with Call of Cthulhu being it's, it's our world, but a little bit different is a really good chance to directly address those things. Uh, in you. a way, I think yeah. Sage, Sage's stuff with Marvel probably falls in that same kind of position where like if you've got, you know, someone who's unstoppable and unkillable who smashes through your, your building and destroys it while he's in the middle of fighting some, you know, some other guy in a cape. Yeah, that's a Tuesday for them, but they just destroyed your entire livelihood. And and it's that same kind of a thing where in a way, you know, superheroes, I think, can kind of be that same like elder god uh level of of threat mm-hmm. yeah a- approaching a game system as a system, that's that's fascinating to me and Miriam, something that like i am dying to get your perspective on is because i i play fifth edition pretty regularly uh we recently converted over and the game i'm playing in right now we're all kind of like hippie nature people we're not trying to interfere with the world much and we're we were sent in by a group to specifically organize this place and we're organizing it against the group now. And yet I'm noticing the game is still encouraging me to go in, beat people up in their own homes and take their stuff uh, and kick them out. So with Musafers, what were, and now you're even working on moving away from that, but what were things you did with that fifth edition setting that you knew setting out, okay, this is going to push us in this direction that helped you go against that? Because like, it's, a very enjoyable show like when i listen to it it's very it's very human it's very enjoyable what are some things that you might have grappled with in ways where you're like okay and now what are you looking to for a new system that fifth edition wasn't giving you so um if you've listened to the eight episodes so far there is little to no combat in it in fact you even you start to get the inkling of a combat towards the very end of the eighth episode yeah and the ninth episode when it releases it actually resolves that combat um so it isn't until pretty much towards the end of this particular season that you even see a fight um so the biggest thing was to essentially not worry about um, feeding into or going into the mechanics, like the conceit of the game. Um, there is a skill system and I relied, I think more heavily on that on, on class features where possible uh, um, because a lot of the encounters and the events that happen in the show is more about what happens on their journey. Um, You know, bit of a spoiler, uh, they leave town and they go traipsing in the countryside while they're following a caravan, hence the travelers bit of the Musafirs. And uh, they come across different places where things happen and they discover more about the world. Um, They have an opportunity to learn more about themselves really while they're traveling and really focusing on that interpersonal stories that happen and and ultimately like the why i wanted to do the masafers and why i wanted to have serzamine and the stale is to focus on other communities and not essentially an exotic skin on medieval fantasy right yeah and w- did that require, because there's not a lot of good source material. I mean, I like I have been role playing for a long time and I remember some of the settings in the 90s coming out that were just, it's like, it's clear who wrote this and it wasn't anybody who was informed. Like, has that been a lot of extra work that you've put in or? It's a work of love. It's um, It's one of those things where it would definitely have been nicer to have something that was already written that I could draw from but at the same time I don't mind doing it I don't mind writing because I feel like I'd rather be the one telling it than waiting for someone else to tell it for me and in fact some of like Asians Represent which is another great podcast is doing a lot of really great work of critically examining these old campaign settings um, with their critical read series I'm actually part of the panel for the Al Qadim setting which is this mishmash or arabian uh setting and it's oh god like 
we are, I think, maybe are four or five episodes in, and they're essentially like three hour long. So we've already done like 15 hours or so, and we're still on page 14 or 15 mm -hmm. of the book. Yeah, that was the setting I was thinking about kind of going back. Um, and I think that's something that's so exciting about how role playing games can evolve now that actual play podcasts are a regular entertainment. And it seems like everybody who makes a living from doing it, it's like, I can't believe I'm being paid to play either Dungeons and Dragons or these other role playing systems. And much like how we went from D&D &D to all of these different D20 systems, like there's White Wolf, there's Call of Cthulhu. All, all sorts of things. It seems like now we're branching out from fifth edition as this common language and more role-playing podcasts are adopting these different systems. So I'm excited to see kind of where that goes. It helps um, that our entire cast are game designers. So. I didn't know that. Yeah. That yeah. Is... Ajay just recently got Bolt out, which is a great uh, system. Mm -hmm. um, and then Amr is working on a couple of systems that I'm not sure whether they're released or not, but like there's a whole Twitter like uh, dice math thing that they've done. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's so cool. And that actually leads into the, my next question, um, which I think will also be. Uh oh. Oh no. Be helpful for the audience and unwieldy. Um, even fairly rules light. Like I know, Sage, with Marvels, you had these two thematic dice that you would use, but even then, it, it took some um, literacy to be able to know which one you're pulling from and whatnot. What are house rules that you had going in that you knew, okay, we're going to do this for the sake of? We're all recording maybe either over Zoom or at a table, but the audience is probably just going to be either listening or following along with a transcript. Um, what, for, for all of you, what are rules that you found that you used and didn't like? What are good just general house rules, no matter what system you're using, that you think make for a good podcast experience? I can speak to that. Um, anything that you have to stop and talk about shouldn't <laughs> stay <laughs> uh certainly this is an opinion you know um I, and, I, and i guess it starts it starts to beg the question is like what what kind of actual play are you trying to make and and what 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 kind of game are you trying to play in general because i i think there's starting to be this dichotomy between um the thing is like at its bare bones tabletop role playing is still a game like you're still playing a game because that's how the whole system like was invented right uh, nobody had the intent for this all to be recorded as entertainment but that's changed now that we're in this digital realm um and people want to share their stories so there's there's this very clear difference I've noticed between something that's very fun to play and something that's very fun to listen to. Yeah. They're they're not the same at all. And it's it's sometimes I, I can tell a hard pill to swallow for um, actual play creators, uh, myself included. Right. I, I mentioned earlier my first system that I designed is called the one system for our very first season uh, way back in 2017. I'm pretty proud of that system considering it was my first but uh there was already like issues with just having to stop and figure out the math um uh, and and calculating decisions between the players and and in that in the gameplay right and i don't think as a listener i've ever been fully engaged when the the audio experience is about the gameplay it should be about the story and this is just my opinion because I guarantee you there are a lot of listeners out there that love the nitty gritty, you know, give me all the math. I want to learn all about the the, the inner workings of your system. Um, but I, I would say for like the average listener, it's it you know people just kind of glaze over. Mm -hmm. So my my rule for myself as I've gone into each new series and twenty sided stories has been to strip out as much tabletop table talk as I possibly can. And that's both an editing thing and a game design thing. In the game design, I wanna always be encouraging role play above all else and have something 
so quick that you can calculate that you don't need to sit and um, think about it. And sometimes I, I miss the cue, I miss the mark on that one, and we still have to talk about that stuff. But that's why I can cut that out later. And you have to know while you're playing if this is content, you know what sort of cues can you can you just quickly rewind and act out as opposed to, you know just kind of hoping people were catch, you know, following along that, that little clunk session where you were talking about the result. Um, we do that all the time on the show where we'll roll something. We'll all kind of be like, once we have it clicked in, boom, rewind, do it again in character and then proceed, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's the idea of acknowledging people are going to be listening and I'm going to be editing this. So on the one hand, you don't want to make a bunch of extra work for yourself because mm -hmm. On, on my as an editor i know an hour of extra recording or even 10 minutes of extra recording can be an extra hour of work um mm -hmm. just just as far as the translation goes um Miriam, something i've noticed that you've done to kind of keep both is for one you are using the more skill system but also you have these mid episode uh or the, these like between episode sessions where you do get into kind of the nitty gritty um have you found, how is the engagement with that part of the podcast been? Where for people who are fond of that system, you can listen to the story, but then you're like, well, I want to know what they did on, say, their short rest. Uh, yeah, so I, like, I, as the editor, if I'm falling asleep while I'm editing it, I'm pretty sure it's not going to make a very good podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, uh, I like like Sage said, there are some people who really would like the nitty gritty. So here's content for them. And um, I say a lot of times that if you're listening to the podcast, hoping you learn how D and D is going to be played, you're not, <laughs> because it is meant to be sort of an improv audio drama, like a lot of actual plays kind of morph into, mm -hmm. and uh, it's. Uh, what I've done at least, and it was definitely trial and error because um, is I allow the roles to happen because essentially you're still playing D&D, &D, but I cut them out. And I just like once the once similar to how you have that, OK, you have your table talk and then rewind and do it in character. I did very similar things off also saying, OK, cool. So, yeah, that was a success or that was a failure or that was a partial success. How did what do you actually do and sort of create questions as the facilitator to make sure the players say something that is more in character and more sort of immersive I, 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 oh yeah go ahead. go ahead i just had a quick question along those lines did you find yourself i mean the way you describe your game i'm wondering do you feel like you kind of found yourself fighting against uh, the system to some degree. Um, or... Yes and no. Uh, yes, because um, after a while, especially with combat, which is why I've rarely dealt with combat, it can get repetitive because it's the same thing over and over again. How many different ways can you say you beat a person down? Um, and um, I find with skills, there's a little more leeway. Um, and for the most part, I don't actually get into roles unless I feel like there's a very good chance of randomness or success or failure. Sometimes I just let the player stalk me into whatever is going to happen. And yeah, um, I agree with that. yeah and, and sometimes the players opt to fail or bumble something by their by themselves at that point i'm like i'm not gonna let you roll like i think one of the biggest examples that people keep coming back to was they decided to have a chess game to figure out who gets to throw the first punch rpg chess boxing <laughs> heck yeah well and and two words that i think are fascinating that uh people who are in the audience is rather than game master, like Sage has the role of director and uh, Miriam just said facilitator. And that's very interesting to me because that changes the way you're looking at this. And having been at the table with Sage, I, some like one of the ways that you kind of uh, streamline things is you'll, when people are getting off topic, you'll be like, hey, we, we're still, people are going to have to listen to this. Let's get back to this scene. Um, Luke, you, 
your show kind of fits in between both of these in that you go in and it is very much an audio drama, but it's also very much Call of Cthulhu. What are rules that you found work really well with the podcast format versus ones that either don't make the cut or you kind of are, are looser on? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Well, I mean, I think a lot of that just comes down to using a lot of the, the core components, uh, using them sparingly. Like a, a big thing that I think is a general piece of advice, whether you're doing this or just running a game at home is, you know, uh, uh, avoid unnecessary roles. Like uh, people shouldn't be saying, you know, I want to, I want to drive to the store and then roll their drive auto skill. Um, uh, first of all, that's a terrible habit for them to be in as a player. And you shouldn't be asking for that for every little thing that they're going to do. Uh, especially if it's something where um, the, risk of failure is either A, not interesting, or B, would be uh, uh, something that uh, would slow down the plot. Um, mm -hmm. Avoiding that, I think, is good. But um, in general, with like the things that uh, I cut down on, you know, in this context, usually uh, a series is like one adventure, basically. So, you know, that may run either, uh, like our, our the one that we have uh, to be series three is actually pretty much real time. Another one maybe takes place, you know, over a few days or something like that. So uh, there are rules for like researching tomes and, and going through, you know, libraries and mythos material and all of that, which is potentially interesting if you're running a longer game where somebody's gotten their hands on a copy of the Necronomicon and they're, you know, they're, they're learning to, to read Arabic so that they can then try to translate this, this um, uh, book that they've gotten their hands on and it's a whole long thing that may be the character over you know uh many many game sessions but that's not really appropriate to to my game so usually i don't worry about how long it takes to read a book or something like that um uh the uh the sanity rules i, I tend to run pretty streamlined and quick um you know there's kind of a whole secondary aspect of it where if your character uh, fails an intelligence role, they potentially don't uh, um, recognize the danger of whatever mythos thing they're encountering. Uh, and I just usually cut that out because it's an extra set of roles that really, for the, sh for the purposes of a shorter game like that, uh, it doesn't suit it. Hmm. But in, in general, I think um, one of the strengths of Call of Cthulhu that I like about it is you have core th understandings of things that your character is good at, but generally, um, how your character goes about things, how they they carry themselves, the the system doesn't really get in the way of that. Uh, you know, you you could potentially go through an entire Call of Cthulhu adventure without picking up a gun, uh, or or even like throwing a punch or anything. Which D and D, you know, is it's almost built around the combat system, and the skills right. are secondary, which is why. Uh, Miriam's answer, I think, was kind of interesting about that. And that was what was running through my head when I was uh, yeah. uh, hearing that. Uh, Call of Cthulhu is just a different system that's not built for that. So, um, I mean, combat is potentially a big thing. But uh, Con generally... Usually, the, the reputation of Call of Cthulhu is if you're getting in combat, you probably did something wrong. Yeah, well... Uh, things are way more likely to go terribly. <laughs> yeah, one of one of the, um, uh, like, not Call of Cthulhu, Cthulhu games, Cthulhu Dark, basically is literally that. If you get in combat, that is a failure state and you have just lost the adventure. That's fascinating. I, ha I have one follow-up question before we go to uh, audience questions uh, for you, because both uh, Sage and Miriam edit their shows. And so mm -hmm. they know while they're running it, I'm going to have to edit this later. Are there conversations you've had with the editors of your show where they're like, hey, this actually doesn't work great, or hey, more of this? Or have yeah. you found in your long experience of running games, you kind of had that... Uh, instinct going in um well uh in, in general i mean i've got a lot of experience running uh live action role-playing games and like working to design them for that and those are fundamentally games that are designed to be like done on the fly and and you know you kind of have to be it, it's they're very uh you know performance driven and mm -hmm. so um along those lines uh i think i've got that experience that I kind of take towards this, but when we when we ran the first one, I didn't see anything of the editing until it was all done. Uh, the second time around, um, I uh, had a little more input. Uh, I had some some back and forth with 
Kat, my, uh, um, uh, the, our kind of our showrunner to, to talk about some of the aspects of editing, uh, both from the perspective of helping the story flow and also um, uh, to kind of maintain that, you know, Cthulhu RPG element, because we don't want to strip that out entirely. In, in right. our, our goal is to kind of blend them together. Yeah. And um, so uh, with that, um, that was also a facet of it of, you know, some some of the things that we would do like re-records to kind of go back and, and redo we wanted to kind of maintain some of the authenticity to it while we we're at it um and so along those lines it's after the first one i was a lot more cognizant of that necessity of editing things so um uh with it if if we did have something that didn't quite work we might backtrack that as a, as a group in a way where I probably wouldn't bother otherwise because you know if you're if you're running it if you're running it for just the purposes of you know getting a game to go along you know you just kind of uh smooth over those bumps and just keep going because it's better to do that for the purposes of a game than to stop it and rewind in most yeah. cases yeah uh, well and that's something that's cool about podcasts is you are able to go and rewind yeah. and help facilitate yeah Bob. So, can I pull you in for listener questions? And Luke, feel free to keep going while Bob pulls us. No, that's all, that's all I had. That's good. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so the first and also, one here we... And also, how are we doing on time? Just because I know this was delayed. Are we still? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, did we lose Bob? Bob. Oh, no. What about... Bob, you're my number one guy. Right on cue. <laughs> I am back. To, there to we go. Hear me. Well, we Sorry did not about that, question. everyone. No, there wasn't a question. I did say that we're good to go till 410. Sorry, I lost my connection there, but we are good to go. Uh, our Perfect. first question, question is actually specifically for Miriam. Um, we've heard a little bit about how the creators their systems as game matters. Am I out again? Yeah. Uh, I, I missed a couple of words. Okay. If you want to type them in the message as well, um, that way I can read them out. Can you hear me? Oh, my yes. internet. Yes. Okay. I will try again. My apologies. We heard a little bit about how the creators push back against their settings and subverted their systems as game masters. I'm wondering if Miriam could speak to how they accomplished that as a player and part of the collaborative storytelling team on Prison Pals. Uh, yeah, so we initially, when I joined the cast uh, for a very short, sweet while, um, and uh, uh, we are now actually moving towards a second volume where I'll be taking the GMing seat, but for the two or three episodes in which I was a player, uh, we were still playing with D&D &D 5e. And um, because it is an all ages uh, podcast, uh, there were quite a few things off the bat that we weren't going to do in terms of content, uh, but also in regards to uh, death, there were a couple of things because, you know, like, Death can be pretty serious, um, especially for kids. And um, it was more, a, it was the concept of essentially losing the will to continue, like sort of you're basically done with the adventuring party if you die, big quotation marks. Um, uh, and it was essentially testing your will with the um, uh, death save throw system that is there for 5e um it still used the same thing so it was essentially just changing what those mechanics meant um although that didn't come up when i played uh but it did come up when um i had joined the cast and uh yeah it was it was basically just choosing to do things or not and it's as simple as that, because ultimately, no one's going to show up in your door and be like, you can't do that. You can do whatever you want with the system. So if you want to 
if you want to have a mechanic, have it. Otherwise, don't. Just toss it out. And and the biggest thing, especially because there is this um, feeling of wanting to roll for everything, don't. Um, if it takes away your agency as a player or as a GM for the collaborative storytelling experience, then don't roll. Just either let it happen or don't. Yeah, that's a, that's a, just the idea of recontextualizing of rule, rules, especially like, oh, this is your will to go on to keep doing this. That's so cool. And that's something that uh, that, that I give credit to. Yeah. Uh, I give credit to the GM, Russ, mainly because that was um, their thing for. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Shout out to Russ and the Prism Pals. Yeah, Prism Pals is awesome. Bob, you have another one for us? Absolutely. Um, which game systems or homebrew tweaks have been most successful in helping you and your players tell a compelling story? I can talk about one system, which is the burning wheel system, which you find in Mouse Guard, um, which I've noticed some of fifth edition is kind of adopted in the idea of having values for your characters, kind of what you want to do. Uh, but to relate to the last thing, it uh, doesn't have death involved typically. It's typically wounds. Usually death is a decision a player makes with the game master. Um, but it's a game where being stronger doesn't make for a better experience. Like oftentimes playing a more meek or inexperienced character leads to way more interesting storytelling. I ran two parallel games of Mouse Guard for a year. And one group was kind of the weird, like non-combat group, and one was a super combat group. And when they met up at the end of the year, the first group was way more capable because they had grown way more within the system itself. So check out Burning Wheel; it's a good one. <laughs> um, I guess I'll also say like anything that encourages like risk and reward in a cinematic way. Um, I'm just trying to think of some things that I've done. I mean, like you see them in systems all the time, but like, um, a, a, as was mentioned, like failure is good. If this is, if this is something you're trying to make, uh, compelling in terms of narrative, I feel like as, uh, again, like when you're playing a game and you're treating this as a game to play, your natural instinct is to win and to, um, succeed because that's how the games are almost always designed. That's literally like the point of calling something a game, whether it's a sport or an arcade game or a tabletop game. But when it comes to creating an audio narrative, you know, uh, again, just going back to my theater improv background, like doing an improv scene is not about winning and bad improvisers are the ones who try to play, uh, you know, as if they have something to, to win. So I, I try to always encourage in my systems that uh, failure is not a bad thing and you won't be like eternally punished. Uh, it'll just be interesting and give you something to, to work with. Um, well, I've also noticed like you don't forward, essentially failing forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't fudge rule or fudge dice. And for <laughs> audiences who don't know what that means, fudging dice is when you roll something, you know, uh, I think the story would be better if I rolled this instead. So you just take that result. But mm -hmm. I noticed 20 sided story. Someone was commenting on that, I think, on Twitter on like, oh, Sage is not pulling punches like the all <laughs> this entire campaign could fail right now because the people are rolling so poorly. Yeah, it's it's kind of risky because there are some areas where it's like it feels like the story would be better if you if you were writing this as a script, there's a very clear, like obvious choice. What, what you would do if you're going to put this in the black and white succeed or fail thing. But I think that's part of what makes this particular medium compelling is that we collaboratively are not in control of that. So no matter what happens, we then have to look at it, stare it in the face and make it interesting. Um, so with something like failing where it was like a really epic moment or something like that, um, I think that is in some weird way, the dice telling you, no, 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 no. That was the obvious choice. You should take the hard route. I bet you can do it. Um, and it's paid off like every time, you know, like sometimes wow. it feels clunky in the moment, but when we work at it, 
ultimately it, that, it leads us somewhere that's very very uh, keeps us in the moment and keeps it keeps us like performing our best yeah if you ever want to sweat bullets people in the audience the finale of marvels <laughs> uh is one of the wildest exchange of dice i've yeah. ever heard there was a lot of opportunities in there for me to to you know totally sh shortcut my own rules um but i could feel it in the room that like that sort of tension was adding to the story so we just did it <laughs> and then luke what are your thoughts uh yeah well i mean for one i think that uh that risk reward angle um it's it's not a uh it's not a homebrew but it's actually a part of seventh edition call of cthulhu that they introduced that i absolutely adore and it's kind of like what sage was saying where you know like really risking something where that you have an opportunity and if you fail a role in seventh edition cthulhu you can uh choose to push that role and then uh basically you know if something failed maybe there's you know no real consequence you just don't do it but if you push the role there is always consequence and uh you know things can things can go drastically off the rails if you do that uh, you know, and sometimes that that leads to really some really interesting situations too, where you know they uh, they they take that risk and it just doesn't pay off, and you know they have to continue on from there. And I I really do enjoy that kind of stuff too. And I think uh, I think uh, Cthulhu is well suited in general to to the sort of things that um, get people to play characters and to um, uh uh that, that i don't know that it really needs a ton of house ruling really in as much as i'd say stripping down like you you peel mm -hmm. some of the stuff away but like the entire back page of the call of cthulhu character sheet uh i mean it's it's full of stuff that is all about creating interesting characters like you know what are uh um you know some important connections you have personal connections what's an important an important thing to you what is a mm -hmm an ideal that you have, what is a, uh, uh, what is an important location in your history? And those are things that like people can fill in in their character backstories. And I think um, when players engage with them, it's, it, it really gives a really good sense of a rooted character that has a history. Right. Um, that is not just yeah. like, you know, emerging fully formed into the tavern as an adventurer with a, a blank slate. And I think yeah, it's, it's really good for that. As much yeah. as I can talk about, like, I design my own systems, um, really, it all comes down to that. It's like, what what things can I p continually peel back so that most of the time the players are just thinking about their character and not about, you know, a prize at the end of the tunnel, you know, or, or um, any of these numbers on their sheets. I don't want people to be looking down the entire time we're recording. You know, I want them to be making as much eye contact as possible. Yeah. Bob, do you have a last question for us? Uh, I've actually got oh, yeah. more if people are okay with that. Um, up first is any more issues to watch out for when running combat or framing enemies as morally okay to kill? I, I feel like with framing enemies as morally right to kill, you need to give your players an option to get through combat without killing them. Like if that's the kind of game you want to run, that shouldn't be the first obvious choice. And then Mir Miriam, you're talking about, you have it, you've done your first combat in the upcoming episode. Uh, yeah. And, and, and that was more of a, um, the enemy was such where f f not fighting them was not quite an option. That was almost a forced encounter of a way, but it made sense thematically that would happen. Um, and I don't want to get into the details of it because that might be a bit of a spoiler, but um, I there is always the option of not fighting. So having to justify killing someone, that's a pretty odd question to come into when, when you get into a combat, really. I would say as a quick piece of advice for everybody, not even just GMs, every encounter is probably going to take three times as long as you think it will. <laughs> yes. Yes. So just go into Even... it with that and do like whatever you think might be like too little 
uh, of like things to happen. No, no, no. You can literally like do the smallest thing. I mean, maybe I'm just speaking for like the players I usually play with. You know, like, we, but... like even for PBTA games, which again really bear down things and essentially a um, what would be considered a D and D encounter, combat encounter, can be resolved in like two or three rolls. Um, even in resolving those two or three roles, you still have to describe what you're doing, um, even if the actual like like the number of roles. So it's it's definitely takes it's it's a lot more work. Like Sage said, it's a lot more work than it requires. <laughs> So you can do, you can get very far with very little, I would say. Yeah. And that's why I try, try to, that's how I try to handle combat. It's just like, what is the slimmest amount of stuff I can throw into this? And usually that's already more content than we need. Yeah. Luke, how often are, I've listened to the first series, but how often are you going for fights? Because I know Cthulhu does have a combat system. But yeah, it also yeah. has a running away chase system. Or, yeah, you know. yeah. It's kind of the big irony, I think, of Call of Cthulhu is it's got a pretty robust combat system, but you can easily run an entire adventure without even using it. Like, in the, the first series, you know, there wasn't anything until the final conclusion. And even that, like, um, the actual big win was done by a character singing. So, like, the, the combat that took place afterwards was entirely super, super, superfluous to the, the greater threat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, in that context, um, I mean, running Cthulhu stuff, I think it's a little different. Uh, you know, if I were running Paranoia, combat's a given, but it's also a way more slapstick game. And, yeah. you know, everybody in Alpha Complex is a monster, so no one's innocent. <laughs> um but uh in, in in the context of call of cthulhu i think um it's a weird place because the monsters are way less human in a lot of ways but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are monsters like they they you know they they may be um uh you know uh, a, a species that is difficult to understand and has their own weird motivations, but that's not necessarily something that um, uh, in all, in all cases may require having a combat to resolve, but uh, it, it just kind of depends. Um, I, I, I think, I think this one for me, for me to give a full answer, this, that, that would probably be 20 minutes on its own. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I think the insights, all of you, like two of my big takeaways are you don't need to have combat that often. And then also the combat does not need to be that complex to fill out a whole thing. Um, yeah. I want to take a minute for all of you to be able to plug your things like Sage people can actually go and download these role-playing systems uh, Miriam, you're involved in so many, so many things. And then Luke, you have this stream coming up. Uh, so if you could take like one minute each to do that and plug your Twitter handles and or Patreons. Sure. Well, I'm Sage, Sage GC. Uh, I'm the director of 20 Sided Stories. And on 20 Sided Stories, we design our own systems. And they're uh, all available for free at sagegc.com slash games on itch.io. Um, donations are welcome, but don't sweat it. The PDFs are are free for you to check out and try. Um, and I have a new one coming out tomorrow, actually, or Tuesday. Um, Do you want to tell the... people what it is? Do you want to give them a sneak peek? Or are you gonna you gonna hold no. that? No, okay. <laughs> Holding Travis it close says, to the chat. <laughs> yeah, Travis says get me to do that too. I don't. Yeah, no. no. We'll 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 reveal it tomorrow. But um, it's very fun. I'm proud of it. Simple as like the, all the other ones. Um, I'm on Twitter at sage underscore. GC. If you know anybody who works at Twitter that can help me get rid of that underscore, that would be great. Uh, otherwise, 20 Sided Stories is at 20 Sided Stories. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'll go next. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm Mariam. Uh, I go by they, them pronouns, and you can find me on Twitter at media underscore junkie. Uh, I'm writing Serzamine, which is a South Asian fantasy setting. Uh, and uh, you can see it at work on the Mosafers uh, and um, also on Kahania, which is a um, live stream uh, actual play that is on Heutopia, 
um, which is a Twitch channel that I am one of the co-founders on uh, for BIM POC by BIM POC. And uh, I'm also a cast member of Prison Pals. We have a lot of exciting things coming up on that, that um, I think there'll be an update coming out soon. And um, I will be a co-host for a new show that will happen once She's a Super Geek ends. And stay tuned for that on my Twitter. Yeah. And then Luke. Okay. Uh, well, uh, you can uh, reach uh, myself and the, and the Mystery Program crew uh, at Cthulhu Mystery on Twitter. And uh, we have a... Uh, uh, a live event coming up for charity for the uh, Transgender Law Center. Uh, and that is going to be uh, November 13th and 14th, uh, starting at 7 p.m. And you have, for people who are in the audio drama pod tales world, your cast for that is just, uh, it's fantastic. It's very exciting. All right, take it away, Bob. Thank you all so much for, for coming and, and bearing with us with our technical difficulties today. Uh, this session is a part of Podtails 2020, three weekends of programming brought to you in partnership with the Sarahs, the Sarah Lawrence College International Audio Fiction Award. For a full list of sessions, visit podtales.org and be sure to subscribe to Podtails on the podcatcher of your choice to find the podcast showcase selection. If you'd like what we're doing here, please consider sp supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash podtails. Thank you all so much. Yay.